Good evening. This is Peter Tobin introducing... Lux Radio Theatre. Tonight and every Monday night at this time, Lux Radio Theatre presents for your entertainment the finest in radio drama. This week we present Jane Eyre from the novel by Charlotte Bronte. Literature has not duplicated such a love story as that of the embittered, tragically lonely Rochester and the untouched and innocent but intellectual Jane Eyre. Jane arrives at Thornfield to take up the position of governess to Rochester's ward. Rochester comes home from abroad, sick of his shallow and sordid affairs, in a harsh and bitter frame of mind. He meets Jane. In her, he found all the goodness and truth for which he so yearned. In her, he found true love. And yet the ties of his past life bound him fast. Was he to be denied the happiness he could find with Jane? For he knew that if he told her the truth, he would surely lose her. Listen in a few moments to Jane Eyre. Adapted for radio by Bernie Janion, produced for Lux Radio Theatre by Anne Freed, and directed by Henry Diffenthal. Leah, and then bring tea at once. Yes, Mrs. Fairfax. Uh, remember, tea at once, Leah. Yes, Mrs. Fairfax. Oh, good afternoon. Oh, this is Thornfield Hall. Yes, yes. My name is Miss Eyre. I think I'm expecting. Miss Eyre. Oh, welcome to Thornfield Hall, Miss Eyre. Mrs. Fairfax. Yes. Oh, do put down your bag, my dear. Oh, Leah, I should have taken it from you. That's right. Now, take off your bonnet and cloak and come to the fire. Or would you rather go straight to your room? Oh, no. No, I'd like to sit here for a moment. It, it was rather cold in the coat. Yes. John met you punctually, I trust. You didn't have to wait at the inn. No. It was kind of you to send the carriage for me, Mrs. Fairfax. I could easily have walked. What? Four miles? <laughs> Nonsense. Oh, how neat you look. And you must have started at daybreak. I tidied myself at the inn. I wanted to make a good impression. Oh, your letters have already done that, my dear. Ah, here's Leah with the tea. I'm sure you must be longing for a cup. Uh, take Miss Eyre's bag up to her room, will you, Leah? Yes, Mrs. Fairfax. Now, oh, come and sit here by me. This is your first position as governess, I think you said when you wrote, Miss Eyre? Uh, yes. Uh, but, but I've been teaching at school for more than two years. I'm very used to children. Oh, I never meant it as a criticism, my dear. I'm sure you suit me perfectly. Uh, Miss Temple's reference was most satisfactory. Was it a very large school? Um, let me see, what was the name of it? Um, Lowood. Ah. Yes, very large. There were more than 80 pupils. Oh, dear me. What a noise they must have made. I wonder you could stand it. They didn't make a noise, Mrs. Fairfax. Oh? Children aren't high-spirited when they're hungry. Hungry? Oh, my dear, do you mean to say that the children weren't fed there? Yes. But... What were their parents thinking of to send them to such a place? They had no parents. It was a charity school. Oh. If I hadn't been sent there, I should have had no education at all. You? I was a pupil there before I became a teacher, Mrs. Fairfax. Oh, my dear, how dreadful it must have been for you. Milk in your tea? Oh, yes, please. <laughs> your advertisement was... Well... You can't think how I long to get away from that place. Oh, of course, of course, naturally you would. And it'll be so much easier for you here with only one little girl to teach. Your tea. Oh, thank you. Shall I see my pupil soon? As soon as we've had tea, I'll take you up to her. I thought we might chat for a little first. <laughs> Adele is inclined to monopolize the conversation. <laughs> well, and what do you think of Thornfield, Miss Eyre, from what you've seen of it? Do you think you'll be happy here? I'm sure I shall. What a beautiful house it is. Mm, it's not in the order it should be by any means. 
I wish Mr. Rochester would take it into his head to live here permanently. Mr. Rochester? Who's he? Your employer, my dear. The owner of Thornfield. I thought... I thought Thornfield belonged to you. Oh, bless you, Miss Eyre. What an idea. I'm only the housekeeper. But you engaged me. Such things are part of my duties. Mr. Rochester commissioned me to find a governess for Adele, and, well, you seem to me to be a suitable person. I see. I hope Mr. Rochester will approve of me. Oh, to be sure he will. If he ever sees you, he's travelling abroad at the moment. I've no notion at all when I shall see him again. Maybe tomorrow, it may be next year, according to his fancy. One never knows what Mr. Rochester may choose to do. He sounds a strange man. Oh, I've been with him a number of years, Miss Eyre, and I still don't pretend to understand him. But he's a good master for all that, and I've known him do many a kind action. Oh, but you're eating nothing, my dear. You must be hungry. Do have something. Uh, no. No, thank you. I, I, I think I'm still too excited. Oh. Has Thornfield been in the Rochester family a long time? Well, the Rochesters built it more than three centuries ago. Uh, these, these, these portraits here. These are some of Mr. Rochester's ancestors. Oh, that is his mother. Is he like her? Oh, no, not at all. You will find Mr. Rochester is like no one but himself. And his wife? Is there a portrait of her? Oh, uh, Mr. Rochester isn't married, my dear. My pupil, I, I thought she was his, his daughter. Da no, no, no. Adele is only his ward. Mr. Rochester had known her mother in Paris, and when she died and the child was left destitute, he brought her here to Thornfield and denied her nothing. Oh. Now, from the window here, you can see something of the Thornfield estate. All that land and more is Mr. Rochester's. Oh. But if he's still young... Oh, yes, yes, my dear, he's young. He's barely 40. Forty? <laughs> that seems old, no doubt, to you, my dear. But when a man is as rich as Mr. Rochester, he can be forty and still choose where he likes. Come along. I'll show you to your room. It's up the stairs here. I've put you in the bedroom next to mine. It's a pretty room. It, it overlooks the garden. Are Mr. Rochester's apartments on that side? In the West Wing? Uh, what? Uh, oh, no. Uh, no, no. No, Miss Eyre. That wing is never used now. It's entirely closed up. Uh, come along, then, this this way. Oh, um, I forgot my bonnet and cloak. I, I'll just run back and get them. of the wing is shut up. She has a sewing room there. No doubt she was laughing with one of the servants. It, it, it sounded so strange, so inhuman. Uh, you're imagining things, my dear. It startled you. Yes, yes it, it, it did. I'll speak to Grace later. She's a rough sort of woman, but well, she's useful and she works well. I'm, I'm sorry, Mrs. Fairfax. It was stupid of me to be frightened in, in this lovely house. Yes, well, come along, my dear. Let me show you to your room. You shouldn't have stayed out so long, Jane. I wanted to complete my sketch of Thornfield. And I did. Look. Oh, Miss Eyre, that's excellent. Oh, <laughs> why, a real artist couldn't have done better. I'm rather pleased with it. But you couldn't have been sketching all this time. It's been dark for more than an hour. Well, something else delayed me. Oh, oh don't be shocked, Mrs. Fairfax. I, I've had quite an adventure. An adventure? Oh, my dear, I thought you looked rather flushed as you came in. It was nothing unpleasant, I hope. Oh, not for me. It was for the other person. Oh, my dear, what do you mean? Well, I, whom did you meet? I don't know who he was. I'd never seen him before. I was sitting on the stile drawing when he came galloping down the lane on his horse... He must have been mad. The road was a sheet of ice. And then on the corner, his horse slipped and fell. And and he was thrown off. Oh, I... And I ran to help him up. And, and what do you think? 
He never even thanked me. Oh. Just ordered me to catch his horse and lead it to the stile so that he could mount again. He, um, he didn't say who he was. No. And after that, I don't think I wanted to know. When he got on his horse again, he did condescend to ask me one or two questions. Where I came from and what my position was here. You, um, you answered him, Jane? As briefly as I could, to show him my opinion of his manners. Oh, uh, do, do you know who he could be, Mrs. Fairfax? Tall, dark, and abominably rude. Do you, Mrs. <gasps> Fairfax? Oh, uh, <clears throat> You no longer seem to require an answer, Miss Eyre. You may go, Mrs. Fairfax. Uh, Miss Eyre didn't know, sir, that... I said you may go, uh, Mrs. Fairfax. Uh, yeah, yes, yes, of course, Mr. Rochester. Uh, not you, Miss Eyre. I want to talk to you. Come here. Have you no other dress than that, Miss Eyre? I have one other. Uh, why don't you wear it? It's the only good dress I have. I keep it for important occasions. Don't you think the first time you meet your employer is an important occasion? I didn't know who you were, sir. And I would like to add that if I had... I would never have spoken disrespectfully of you. But you would still have retained your private opinion of my manners. My thoughts are my own, sir. Even a governess is entitled to have those. I hope you weren't badly hurt, sir. For the relief of your intense anxiety, Miss Eyre, no. I have a slight sprain, which will be gone in a day or two. You've been here how long? Three months, sir. Where were you before? Lowood School. Lowood? Isn't that a charity school? Yes. How came you to be sent there? My parents died when I was very young. My aunt, Mrs. Reed, sent me there. You you were glad to go? Yes, I was. Why did she send you to a charity school? Was she poor? No, on the contrary. But she always hated me. Perhaps if I'd been pretty and attractive, she might have liked me better. But I was always plain. Isn't it uh, Brocklehurst or some such name who directs the place? Yes. Mm, harsh man. Harsh rule. Starved the body to sanctify the soul, wasn't that it? Yes. How long were you there? Eight years. You must be tenacious of life to have survived there so long. So, that was where you got that look of another world, at Lowood. How old are you? Eighteen, sir. And what did they teach you at Lowood? Can you play the piano? A little. Mm, that's what every woman says. There's a piano in the next room. Take a candle, leave the door open, and play a tune. That's enough. You were right, Miss Eyre. You play a little. You're fond of sketching? Yes. Now, I suppose you now tell me you draw a little. Well, my book is here, sir. You may judge for yourself. Uh, sit down. I hate people to stand over me. Mm. You seem very fond of my property, Miss Eyre. I think it is very beautiful. You must wonder why I so seldom come here. Well... Yes, sir. And supply your own reasons for my actions, I suppose. Yes. Don't you think such conjectures on your part are rather impertinent? Well, you asked me, sir. I shouldn't have told you otherwise. Thornfield has been in my family for generations. When I was your age, I thought of it as you do. A place beautiful, serene, timeless. But life changes us, Miss Eyre. A place one loves may become a place one hates. I congratulate you. You draw more than a little. One day you may even draw well. It's certainly more worthy of perseverance than your playing. Do you think me handsome? No, sir. I am considered blunt, but it seems you surpass me. Oh, I beg your pardon, sir. I shouldn't have spoken my thoughts. But I like your thoughts. They interest me. I want to know more of them. Don't you want to see your ward? No, I don't want to see her. Not yet. There's a look of puzzlement on your face. Why? Oh, well, I, I'm, I'm not puzzled. Perhaps it is a look of disgust at my behavior, is that it? Let us call it puzzlement, sir. I see you're being kind to me. You're free to speak. Are you disgusted because I won't see Adele? Well, she looks forward so much to your coming home. I don't want to see her because she reminds me of someone I would prefer to forget. Her French mother who charmed the English gold out of my British pockets. You think Adele is my child, don't you? I, I don't know, sir. Neither do I. 
Her mother swore she was, and certainly she could have been. Her name was Celine Varennes. One day I happened to call when I was not expected. I meant to charm her with a surprise. I was the one who received the surprise, and it was not charming. I discovered I had a rival. Had I but known it, I had several. Some years later, she ran off to Italy with a singer and died there. She left Adele, who'd been born about six months before our quarrel, destitute. And that was when you went to fetch her and brought her back to Thornfield. I see Mrs. Fairfax has been talking. Well, she spoke of it as one of your many kind actions. The child had no claim on me, but I have a conscience of a kind. So now you know what you're teaching. Do you want to leave? Do you want me to get another governess? Oh, no, sir. I know what it is to be homeless and without friends. I prefer you when you speak honestly and not morally. But I suppose your lowward upbringing still clings to you. My confession has probably shocked you. I think you're too good for such company, sir. When we're desperately unhappy, Miss Eyre, we seek oblivion. It doesn't matter what company we find it in. Now give me a moral answer to that. Well? I... I don't know why you should ever have been so unhappy. When you have so much. So much? I have nothing. Nothing that matters. I, I, I'm sorry. It's I who should beg your pardon, Miss Eyre. But you touched upon something you don't understand, something I can't explain. What I've told you is nothing. Fate had hit me long before that, and much harder. But I'm wanted elsewhere, and you no doubt have duties to perform. I keep you from them. Good night, Miss Eyre. Good night, sir. Miss Eyre, if at times I should seem harsh or abrupt, please forgive me. I'm used to giving orders to say... Do this, do that. And I've been so long among people who deserve no better treatment. You will make allowances for me. Of course, sir. And thank you for your help in the lane. Mr. Rochester! Stay there, Miss Anne! It's all right now. There's nothing to be afraid of. She, she meant to kill you. Yes, you called out just in time. She, she had a knife. Look, there it is. She dropped it when I called out. Who is she, sir? I, is it Grace Poole? I've heard her laugh like that before. When have you heard it? Oh, the, the, the first day I came here, and several times since. Won't you get rid of her, sir? She, she might try to hurt you again. You're in such danger. Does it matter? You have friends, sir. Who love you and need you. Have I? I can think of none. Unless, could I, by any chance, have made one tonight? I... I meant Miss Ingram, sir. I see. So Mrs. Fairfax has told you about her. Yes, indeed, I must stay alive for Miss Ingram's sake. She mustn't be disappointed. Uh, don't worry. Grace Poole won't harm me. Shall I tell Mrs. Fairfax, sir, to put her on her guard? No. Say nothing of this to anyone. You've seen nothing, heard nothing tonight. You understand? Very well, sir. You're no talking fool, Miss Eyre. I can see that. I place reliance on you. I shall be silent, sir. Good night. I knew you would do me good the moment I saw you. There was something about you, in your eyes, your expression that struck a chord to my very soul. You've saved my life. Thank you, Jane. Time, nearly midnight. 
Blanche must have her beauty sleep. If there's one thing Miss Ingram has no need of, it's that. Is Adele in bed, Miss Eyre? Yes, sir. You must give her my love in the morning. You know you surprised me, Mr. Rochester. Have I? In what way? I should never have thought you were fond of children. I'm not, particularly. And what induced you to take charge of the little Adele? Where did you pick her up? I didn't pick her up. She was left homeless. By whom? Somebody I once knew. But why bring her here? You should have sent her to school. I provided a governess for her. Much the same thing, surely. But governesses are such an insufferable nuisance. Don't you agree, Mama? Now, dear Blanche, don't talk to me about governesses. It makes me shudder even now to think what I suffered from their incompetence and caprice. <laughs> what a job it was inquiring into their backgrounds to see if they were really suitable. What a relief, Mr. Rochester. Mm. I had one who had actually been reared in a pauper school. No. True, I assure you. She was in the house months before I found out. What did you do? Oh, I dismissed her, of course, at a moment's notice. But the wicked deception of it. To pose as a person suitable to teach gentlefolks children. Wasn't she a competent teacher? Oh, I no fault to find with her work. But how could I possibly let her remain in my house with such a background? Heaven knows how she might have contaminated my poor children. <clears throat> yes, Miss Eyre, what is it? Would you excuse me, please, sir? I have a message to give Mrs. Fairfax. Charmingly plain, isn't she? I could almost be jealous of her, Mr. Rochester. Oh, why? Because you insist she shall always be with us. Miss Ingram, you have only to look in your mirror to be completely reassured. Now, where are Colonel Dent and Mr. Ashton? I've only just missed them. They crept out to bed some time ago. Exactly where we should all be. We leave early tomorrow morning. Why did you run away? Why did you make me stay to hear such things? I had a reason. It was cruel. Unkind. What do you think of my future bride, Jane? Will she make me happy? How can I answer that? You've been listening to her practically all night. One little word is enough, Jane. Yes or no? You will make her unhappy. Why? Because you don't love her. What makes you say that? I can see it in every word you speak to her. You try to draw her out. To make her show her worst side deliberately. If you loved her, sir, you wouldn't do that. But love on one side is sometimes enough, I've heard. Does it matter what I think of her as long as she's in love with me? Is she in love with me, Jane? I think she would be proud of you. To have you by her side, but... But she doesn't love me. No, sir. Hmm. We should make a pretty pair, it seems. I continually exposing my wife's worst foibles, and she regarding me much as she'd regard a good horse or some such possession. Are you going to marry her, sir? Of course. Our marriage will be no different from most of the marriages in society. You should learn, Jane. You should be worldly. How can I, sir, when you want me to be honest and truthful? Yes. Yes, Jane, I do. Don't ever change. I think I should be lost without you. <sighs> Who can that be at this time of night? Why doesn't somebody answer it? It'll wake all the guests. I, I think the servants are all in bed, sir. I'll go. It's a gentleman to see you, sir. Who is it? He says his name is Mason, sir. What? From Spanish town in Jamaica. Mason? W what is it? Are you ill? No. I'll be all right. Oh, Jane. Oh, I wish you'd tell me what it is, Mr. Rochester. Oh, how I envy you. Your clear conscience. Your untarnished life. You know, hideous memories. No bitter recollections. I ought to send you away. Far from this unhappy place. Oh, my happiness is here, sir. With you. Won't you let me help you? If I need help, Jane, I'll come to you. I promise. Go to bed now. But what of Mr. Mason? Do as I say. Please. I'll be all right. Come in, Richard. A fine time to call on me. What brings you here? I wanted to see her. Is that so unnatural? You've not seen her in ten years. Why should you want to see her now? I live a great distance, Edward. This is my first opportunity. I'm on business in England and I came straight here. May I see her? I advise you not to. Is she worse? Do you have to ask me that? Don't you remember your father and mother? Not like that, Edward. Not like that. Like that. Is someone with her? Her nurse, Mrs. Poole, all the time. I'd like to see her, Edward. I, I may not be in England again for many years. Is it so much to ask? I'm thinking of your safety. Can't you understand that? I'm not afraid. She'll know me. Will you show me the way? I see her no more often than I'm obliged to. If you must go, you go by yourself. Up the stairs, along the corridor to the west wing. You'll see the door. 
Is she there? No, a further room within. Uh, Knock and tell Mrs. Poole who you are. She'll let you in. Thank you, Edward. Shall I see you before I go? Yes, I'll stay here. Jane, why have you come down? Oh, don't be angry. You look so ill, so worried. Does it matter how I look? It does, to me. I never told you, sir, but I had a letter today. Oh, from whom? My aunt, Mrs. Reed. The woman who condemned you to Lowood? Yes, she's very ill. It seems I'm not without relatives after all. I have an uncle in Madeira. Three years ago, he wanted to adopt me, but she wrote and told him I was dead. She said I died at Lowood. Why would she do such a thing? Oh, he's very rich, it seems. And if he'd adopted me, I should have been her equal. The equal of her children. Shall you write to this uncle? I wrote today. I thought that when I leave here, it would be a home for me to go to. Jane. Help! For heaven's sake, help! What? Wait here, Jane. Jane, there's been an accident. I need your help. What's happened? What is it? Please, please, all of you. There's nothing to be alarmed about. A servant has had a nightmare, that's all. Please go back to your room. She's all right now. Well, I hope you'll turn her away from frightening us all like this. Yes, it terrifies me. She's a dreadful... Yes, well, you'd better get back to bed. Oh, let's see. Can you stand the sight of blood, Jane? I, I think so. Good. Get some water and a sponge quickly. Yes. Has Grace got her under control? Yes. I warned you to be careful. I, I, I brought some, some cloths to bind it. Good. Hold the bowl while I sponge this. Hold up, man. You're not dead yet. You've lost a little blood, that's all. A surgeon will put you right. Edward, I, I, I can't travel tonight. You must travel tonight. How could I explain you to my guests like this? Is your carriage outside? Yeah, on the road. I'll help you to it. You can see a surgeon in the next town. I can't understand, Edward. I never thought. She was so quiet. If you talk to it, weaken yourself. Get his cloak, Jane. I'm nearly done. This isn't an expert job, but it stopped the bleeding. Any surgeon will do the rest. You've got his things, Jane. Mm -hmm. Now, up you get. Lean on me. Jane, clear away those things. Yes, sir. Edward, treat her well. Treat her as well as you can. I think you should try to get some rest, sir. Oh, no, not yet. Let me stay a while and talk to you. Jane... Yes? Suppose at some time in your life you'd made a terrible mistake. Not through your own fault, but because you were deliberately misled. And the consequences of that mistake had followed you through life, poisoning your existence, robbing you of everything that makes life worth living, denying you the simplest forms of happiness that even the poorest can enjoy. And because of that mistake, you wandered here and there, finding what pleasure you could. Heartless sensual pleasure among people who meant nothing to you and whom, in your heart, you despised. And then, returning at last to your home, you suddenly met someone with all the qualities you'd hungered for for so long. Someone who was gentle and kind and good and in whose company you found solace and peace of mind. Someone whom you knew would make you a better person and whom you, in your turn, would make happy. To attain this, to gain a little happiness and give much, would you be justified in ignoring an obstacle, a mere conventional barrier that stood between you and that other person? Would you, Jane? How can I say, sir? I, I don't know what you mean. Jane, I believe with all my soul that I have found my salvation in my love. But you know it already, of course. Don't you think Miss Ingram will make me a splendid wife? Don't you think she's just the person to deform me? May I go now, please, sir? It's late. I'm tired. I shall have to ask you to find another situation. You... You want me to go? But of course. Adele will be going to school. I've no further need of your services. I'll, I'll advertise at once, sir. I, I'll do my best You'll soon to... forget me, Jane. Believe me, it's best that you should. I'll never forget you, sir. Oh, you don't know what it's meant to me. Not to be trampled on and despised. To have you talk to me as an equal. 
I was starved for all those things, and you gave them to me. Oh, if only I, I'd been born rich and handsome instead of obscure and plain. I'd have made it as hard for you to leave me as it is for me to part from you now. I'm sorry, sir. I had no right to speak like this. Jane, stay here at Thornfield. I've tried to send you away, but I can't. Stay here as my wife. Your wife? I love you as my own flesh, Jane. I entreat you to marry me. But... Miss Ingram... I told her I'd lost money. But that wasn't true. It gave her an honorable retreat. I never loved her, Jane, nor she me. I have loved in my life only you. Can you mean it? Do you truly love me? Yes. Let me look into your face. Am I lying? No. Stay with me, Jane. Help me. Don't go away. I'll never leave you. There are things about me, Jane. You will have much to forgive, much to overlook. I only know I love you. Oh, Jane. Jane. <laughs> We're married, Edward. Need we ever come back to Thornfield? Why do you ask that? Because you know I dislike the place. You've laid my ghost for me, my darling. With you beside me, Thornfield has no terrors for me now. No, because I have become afraid of it. You? Why, what's happened, Jane? Well, last night, I heard a step outside my room. And then there was a rustle, as if a dress had brushed against my door. I closed my eyes and lay quiet, thinking it would go away. But it didn't. The door of my room opened. And, and she came in. She? She came up to my bed. And she thrust the light towards my face, staring at me with a look of hatred. I, I tried to cry out, but I, I couldn't. And, and then she came closer. And, and I think I fainted then. But I, when, when I recovered... She'd gone. It was a nightmare, that's all. Many brides have them on the eve of their wedding day. Look at the wedding veil I'm wearing. It's not the one you gave me. Why aren't you wearing it? Because the... it's torn to shreds in my room. Would I do that in my nightmare? Jane, I... Well, who is this woman? Why do you keep her here? I've told you before, Grace Poole won't harm it you. It was not Grace Poole. This time I saw her clearly. Oh, why? Why can't you tell me who she is? After our marriage, I will tell you, but not now. We shall be leaving Thornfield so soon, Jane. Won't you bear with me a little longer if I say I dare not tell you yet? But that wasn't all. Before this woman came, I had a dream. I dreamt you were leaving me. I heard the gallop of your horse, and I knew it was you, and you were leaving me to go to some distant country. And I ran and ran, stumbling and falling and crying out after you, but, but you never turned your head. I saw you like a speck in the distance. As I cried out once more, I woke. And this woman was standing over me. And it was as if she'd come between us to stop me ever reaching you. Oh, my darling, why do you let these dreams frighten you? Am I severed from you by insuperable obstacles? Am I leaving you without a kiss, without a word? This is the ring that within the hour I shall place on your finger. These are realities, Jane. Believe in them and not in phantoms. We leave Thornfield today, and if you wish it, we'll never come back. Oh, you swear you won't leave me? I swear I shall never Mr. Leave. Edward Rochester. Who are you? Forgive my unceremonious entry. The door was open and no servant seemed to be about. I had no choice but to walk in. My name is Briggs. I'm a London solicitor. Your business must wait. I'm on my way to the church. Come, Jane. It's useless to go to the church, Mr. Rochester. The clergyman has gone. There'll be no wedding today. What are you saying? You, Miss Eyre, you were to have married this gentleman this morning? Yes. Has he not told you he's married already? Ma ma married? How 
dare you come here and make such an accusation? This is a copy of the certificate of your marriage 15 years ago to Bertha Mason at Spanish Town, Jamaica. That proves nothing. No? You've no proof that my wife is still living. I think I can satisfy you there, Mr. Rochester. Would you mind stepping in here, sir? Mason! What relation are you to Mrs. Rochester? Her brother. And your sister lives here under this roof? Yes. Lives, do you call it? She exists here, if you can call it existence. My wife is mad. He knew what she'd become, but he never warned me. Yet he comes here today to blast my one chance of happiness. All this, Mr. Rochester, is no excuse for bigotry. Excuse? How easily you say that. But you don't know about my lawful wife. Do you? You shall see her. Then see if you dare sit in judgment of me. Grace Poole! Open the door! Bring my wife down. She has visitors. Now you shall see. No, 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 let me help me. Ah, 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 Call me base and wicked. Only speak to me. Do you hate me so much? Why did you do it? I tried to send you away, but I couldn't. I loved you too much. You shan't suffer by this, Jane. We'll go away. Thornfield shall never see us again. You come with me, Jane. Say you come with me. Why not? You know why not. Because I'm married. Is that what you call marriage? That. I can't go with you. So I was mistaken, even in you. You don't love me. All you valued was the position, the rank I could give you. Now you can't be my wife. You'll be nothing to me. It would be wickedness if I stayed with you. I must go. What will become of me if you go? Oh, don't you care? You know I do. You don't know what my life has been like, Jane. Why, you'd pity me. I was 25 when I married her. And I've been chained to her ever since. But, but she... Surely she wasn't always like... No. For the first few years, I had only screams and curses to endure. But why did you... Why did I marry her? It was arranged for me, Jane, by my father. He wanted me to be rich. I was a younger son with very little property. This woman was the daughter of an old acquaintance, and she had a fortune. My father knew the family was tainted with madness, but told me nothing. I was young, foolish... The marriage took place and I discovered what I'd married. When I think of it... Don't. Don't talk of it anymore. I must, Jane. There's something else you must know. Last January, rid of all mistresses, on a harsh and bitter frame of mind, I came back to England. One frosty winter afternoon, I rode inside a thornfield. And I found... Do you remember, Jane? Don't. I found what I could truly love... I found you. I know I was wrong to deceive you, Jane, but I knew your goodness and truth, and I feared I should lose you. Please, stay with me, Jane. I I can't. Don't drive me back to what I was before. Don't you believe I love you? I know you do. But I must go. I won't let you go. I can't lose you. We live abroad. You shall have my name. No one will ever know. No! No! It would not be wicked to love me. It would be to obey you. I can't stay with you. Why not? Why? Whom would you injure? You've no relatives or friends who care for what you do. I care for myself. All my being cries out to love and comfort you. But I must go. While I still have enough strength to leave you. Goodbye, Edward. Jane, don't go. Jane. Bertha! 
won't see you, sir. Didn't you tell him it was important? Oh, I told him all you said. Didn't you notice how the house has changed, sir? The whole west wing is gone. The staircase was completely burnt away. Yes, I was wondering. How did it happen? It was his wife, sir. His poor, mad wife. She eluded her keeper and set fire to the hangings. It was dead of night. We were all asleep. The whole wing was ablaze before we knew what had happened. Mr. Rochester ordered us out and then went back to look for her. Oh, I know you think he's wicked, sir, but if you had seen how he tried to save that poor creature... Mrs. Fairfax, <laughs> who is that you have with you? It's Mr. Briggs, sir. I was just telling Much you... Much more than you need, I warrant. You may leave us, Mrs. Fairfax. Oh, yes, sir. Mr. Rochester, I had no idea that you... I would never have intruded had I known that was a puppet show. A sight for man to gaze on in horror. Now do you wonder I've no mind to show myself to every caller? Sightless, maimed, an object to be pitied. I'm a little less arrogant than when you called on me last, Mr. Briggs. And the irony of it is, I'm a free man. Yes, free. And like this, your wife died in the fire. Yes, I tried to save her, but she ran from me screaming. She hated me to the last. She climbed under the battlements. What happened next is hard to say. It was all over so quickly. She seemed to lose her balance and fall on the paving below. I hope it was a merciful death for her. But you, your injuries, how were they caused? The staircase collapsed as I fought my way back. I was rescued to become like this. Yeah. May I speak to you on the matter which brought me here? Why not? You've seen me now. It concerns Miss Eyre. What good would I be to her now? What's your interest in her? She is an heiress. An heiress? Her uncle, Mr. John Eyre of Madeira, has died and left his estate. A matter of some 20,000 pounds. An heiress? My little Jane. Why did you come to tell me this? I thought you might be interested to know of her good fortune. Interested? You lawyers don't overstate your case, do you? No, nor do we always enjoy the tasks we have to do. Would you care for me to give you Miss Eyre's address? No. Not even to wish her happiness on her forthcoming marriage? Marriage? Jane? To whom? A cousin twice removed, whom she's met since. She's leaving the country shortly. Where is she going? To India. I thought perhaps you might wish to see her before she left England. What do you think I looked like to a young girl? A sight to shudder at, to hate. You've told me what you came to say. There's a bell somewhere. Ring it. Mrs. Fairfax will show you out. I can find my way. If you should change your mind, you know where to reach me. Is that you, Mrs. Fairfax? Oh, yes, Mr. Rochester. What sort of day is it? Very pleasant, sir. The evening air is quite mild. You should go out, sir. Yes. Tell John to bring my dog. Well, I would come, sir. No. My dog will guide me round, and he won't pity me. Oh, oh dear. Oh, uh, Leah, tell John to bring Pilot. Mr. Rochester is going for a walk. She's here. Hmm? She's come back. But what are you talking about? Miss Anne, Miss Jane, she's here. She's come back. No. She's in the garden. Jane. Yes. Oh, my dear. Dear, how good to see you. Mrs. Fairfax. <laughs> oh, there's so much I want to ask you. How is he, Mrs. Fairfax? Oh, you, you haven't heard? Nothing of him. Only about the fire and the death of his wife. They told me at the inn he wasn't injured. Well, his life was saved, my dear. That is something to be thankful for. Did it hurt him very much when I went away? I think it broke his heart. You were right to go, I know, my dear, but he loved you so much. What made you come back? A feeling that he needed me. I tried to ignore it, but it became so strong, I, I couldn't resist it. Mrs. Fairfax, has he ever cried out for me? Oh. Called my name aloud? Why, why do you ask? But tell me. Why, yes, many times. Sometimes in the middle of the night, when he thinks we're all asleep, I've heard him call... Jane, in a voice of such unhappiness and pain. Oh, my dear, you don't know what it will mean for him to have you here once more. Where is he? I must go to him right away. Oh, but, my dear, I, I should... want to surprise him. Oh, uh... To see the joy in his face when he looks up and sees who it is. Oh, very well. He's walking down by the street. Who 
Who's there? Who is it? Mrs. Fairfax? Mrs. Fairfax is, is in the house. Where are you? I can't see, but I must feel, or my heart will stop and my brain burst. Is it Jane? Yes. Jane. Yes. These are her very fingers. Her hair. She's all here. And her heart, too. Jane Eyre, have you come back to me? Yes. Never to go away from you again. No. Why, why do you push me away? I had forgotten for a moment what I must look like to you. Can you bear to look at me, Jane? Why did you come back? I heard you cry out for me. You heard me? Across the miles that separated us. I heard you calling me. In such bitterness and pain. I had to come. You do need me, Edward. Can you look at me, Jane, and ask that? And you'll stay with me? If you'll have me. I'll be your friend and companion. To read to you. To wait on you. To be eyes and hands to you. You shall not be desolate as long as I live. What you offer me, Jane, is so sweet. I long for it with all my soul. But I mustn't take it. Why not? You're young. You plan to be married. Who told you this? Isn't it true? My cousin asked me to marry him. But I refused. I don't care about being married. You should care, Jane. If I were what I was before and not a sightless block, I would make you care. And you're an heiress, too. That might make you change your mind. It makes no difference. Only that I'm an independent woman now. And, and if you won't have me, I shall build a house of my own. Close up to your door. And you shall come and sit with me of an evening. You're being neglected here. I've no right to batten on your youth and freshness. It won't do, Jane. You spoke of being my friend and my companion. That's no use to me. I want a wife. Do you, sir? Is that unwelcome news, Jane? That depends on whom you choose. You shall choose for me. I will abide by your decision. Choose her who loves you best. I will choose her. I love best. Will you marry me, Jane? Yes. A blind man you will have to lead about by the hand. Yes. Truly, Jane. Most truly. What did you feel when you saw me, Jane? Did the sight of my infirmities shock you? No. All I felt was an overwhelming gladness. I'd come home. Home? Where you are. That's home to me, my dear. Dear Master. In tonight's Lux Radio Theatre presentation of Jane Eyre from the novel by Charlotte Bronte. Jane Eyre was played by Jill Fenson, Rochester by Glyn Day, Mrs. Fairfax by Valerie Miller Brown, Lear by Joy Elfane, Mason by Jack Claff, and Lady Ingram by Lorna Cowell, with Sally Ducrow as Blanche and Reg Richards as Briggs. Jane Eyre was adapted for radio by Bernie Janion, produced for Lux Radio Theatre by Anne Freed, and directed by Henry Diffenthal.